Welcome back, everyone. My name is Alyssa Nahara, and I am here with Nick Young, and we are your co-hosts for the Therapist Uncut podcast. And sitting with us today is Officer Mitch. This is Mitch Brulette. If you guys follow us, then you know that Mitch is pretty fantastic. This is his second time on the show. And today we're going to be focusing on his role as an officer, the multiple roles and paths that has taken him, and how mental health has shown up in those roles. So thank you so much for being here today, Mitch. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I loved the last episode, but I am super stoked for this episode uh, just because most of our listeners know um, the intersection between law enforcement and mental health and crisis mental health. That's just my fiery passion. So um, anytime I get the chance to talk about it, I yeah, love hearing your perspective. And, um, so I think there's two kind of things to consider, right? How mental health shows up in terms of your role in the community and supporting the community. Mm -hmm. And I think last episode you used the word, we are always showing up on everybody's worst day, right? right? Um, and then also how we could probably have 12 episodes on all of these, but um, how mental health officers Right, how law enforcement themselves are impacted by everything they do. So I think there's lots of places we could take this, lots of paths we could take. Yeah, the spaces because I'm like, where are we going to start? I don't know. There's so much here. <laughs> Let's start with what are if, just so our listeners know. What are a few different roles or hats you've worn as an officer? Well, I started nine and a half years as a patrol deputy. Okay. I worked just under three years as a uh, detective doing crimes against children or special victims. Okay. Previously, as a uh, school resource officer. And now as a patrol supervisor. Um, so it's a 20-year law enforcement career. 16 of those years have also been on a SWAT team. Welcome to the Therapist Uncut Podcast, where off-the-clock therapists who happen to be friends share their uncensored thoughts about real life. Join us weekly in spreading positivity and making mental health relatable through casual conversation, inspirational stories, and real talk with friends who happen to be therapists. Please welcome your co-hosts, Nikki Young and Alyssa Nahara. I can tell you from the very first day on patrol, I mean, my second call out of the gate, I'll never forget because I was so bright-eyed and deer in headlights. <laughs> and it was uh, January 23rd, and it was freezing cold, and there was a, a naked male at our lobby and going through a mental health crisis. And it's the second call coming out of the gate. So it's like you see it on a daily where it almost becomes, I'm not going to say normal for us, but we see it on a daily end. Absolutely. And I think there's so much, there's so much of a societal attention on it right now, right? In terms of is law enforcement the appropriate, I'm using air quotes here for those listening, response. But I was just at a panel recently, not on, but at a panel, and you know, the chief in, in Utah was saying, well, no, but there's nobody else, right? Like, yes, there's other things that we need to incorporate into this. However, we've been the ones responding to this for since the creation of, right? Nobody else is awake at 2 a.m. when somebody is psychotic on the bridge, right? So society may not have always been aware that this is happening and now it's in the public's eye. But, I mean, you, you guys do this on the daily. It's huge. And in law enforcement, even from in the 20 years, like the training that you get a little bit in the academy, like a mm -hmm. tiny bit, like they may throw a little, a little bit, at, but it's <laughs> yeah. not it's not much. Right. And by no means are we experts when it comes to it. I'm talking to people we expect, especially years and years ago is, hey, look, if I tell you to do something, just do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times when if somebody's going through a mental crisis, mm -hmm. that's not the mindset that they need, they need to hear. Right. We yeah. We need to do things like maybe build rapport, maybe create distance, maybe not be so. But when somebody going through a mental health crisis, they could view us as, man, he's got a duty belt. He's got guns. He's got pepper sprays. And that's causing his that incident to even skyrocket. Yeah. So I will say law enforcement has done a better job as far as training goes. Mm -hmm. We could call it to a lot of them because it has the potential to escalate. Absolutely. To a situation right? And I think that needs to be considered because as a crisis mental health therapist, there's plenty of calls that I would not go on without an armed mm -hmm. officer or deputy there with me, not to necessarily take primary, but to secure the scene and or be there for, I mean, we each have specialties and they overlap to some degree. Yes. We're given a lot of tools in law enforcement. There's a lot that's expected of us. And it's one of the true professions where we really have a zero. We can't mess up. Like we mm -hmm. have zero... <laughs> Any area that we can we can yeah. do. There's to no margin do wrong. of error. Yeah, no margin job. of error. When somebody's going through a mental health crisis, you know, first it starts by we have to identify. You know, we have to be able to diagnose. Sometimes it's hard to tell, right? right? What it's, that crisis yeah. is? Is it you know substance abuse? Is it alcohol related? You know, that's causing this. So 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going through all these little checklists through your head as you're going there, but yeah. it's a lot to mm-hmm. lot to deal with. So there's some counties that are now, you know, having mobile crisis teams mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. And uh, who might be involved in a mobile crisis team? A lot of time it's, you know, trained uh, clinicians, therapists, that kind of stuff that would go out there. Okay. Um but they're not going to go there without us because we have to provide that safety area from there to work in. You said you've been in law enforcement for about 20 years now. Mm-hmm. What trends have you noticed kind of over the decades when it comes to mental health? The influx of drugs, right? I really think that's a huge, plays a huge role. I, I'm sure it's played a huge role all the time. But, mm-hmm. you know, recently the COVID thing, that completely changed, you know, the mental health, I think, has skyrocketed, right? We've had, you know, veterans coming back with tons of PTSD. So, but I just think we've been on an upward trend when it comes to mental health and like, what do we do for them? Are there mm-hmm. enough services out there? Mm-hmm. Um, do they even want the services, which is one of the big things that I think, you know, we're finding with our, like our transient population, right? A lot of times they're not the families or veterans that are out there because it's the people that choose that they want to be out there. And then, you know, they're going through some kind of crisis. How do we provide help for them if they don't want the help, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, if we could get them the help that they need, then especially in law enforcement, our job is easier, right? Yeah. We have less to deal with on a daily. So I've noticed definitely an, an upward trend. And mm-hmm. why? I don't know. Maybe is it the economy? Maybe, I, I don't know. What's what's causing that? I'm not too sure, but I know it's definitely going up. So I'm curious because you've spoken to just that it's a constant, right? Second, second call of your... Mm-hmm. Career. Um, I'm thinking just back to last week at our office, we have an outpatient counseling um, center and somebody had been walking down the street in a mental health crisis, had seen the counseling sign and thought, oh, they'll be able to help me. Right. And had had popped in. Um, I was not on site. It was one of our office mates who's not a clinician. So she called me and said, I don't know, you know, we got to I don't want to just where are you, essentially. Um, So she handled it beautifully until I got there. But this individual was both suicidal and just needing resources. And so as an outpatient clinician in that setting, ethically and legally, my hands are tied, right? So I contacted a local officer and they came out and they were awesome with him. But it was daytime hours. So they had far more options than if it had been 10 o'clock at night and all these outpatient resource drop-in centers are closed, right? We were able to get this individual to a lower level of care that was going to meet that person's needs, right? Did this person need to be hospitalized? Was the level of suicidality there? No. But it was daytime hours, Monday through Friday, all these drop-in centers are open. They were actually willing to drive him to his clinician's office, made sure that the clinician was there. We called ahead of time, all this, but you don't have that out on patrol at 3 a.m., So if you had a wish list, I'm curious what you would want and like sky's the limit, dream big, which I know you are capable of. um, What would make your job easier in managing mental health? A hundred percent. I mean, I think if we had the ability to have a mobile crisis team that was on call 24 hours a day to immediately provide services, I mean, it would, like I said, we could talk about, you know, county mental health, you know, they're understaffed, you know, overworked. My ultimate goal would be if you had a mobile crisis team to be able to come out to assist us in that immediate right then and there, not a day later or anything like that, that would be ideal because that would allow for maybe that person to get immediate help. And then now the follow up to that would be on that crisis team to do the follow up where law enforcement is not going to do the follow up. on right. it. So mm-hmm. I think mean, because it can't just be a one time thing. There has to be some sort of follow up to it. So yeah. and all these services can't be siloed. Right. Absolutely. Because then you might have a relationship with this person, but you have no idea. And you know, with, with HIPAA laws and privacy, you can't have an idea in, in terms of what the other systems are doing, but the crisis team might be doing this, but then what's their outpatient? So how do we get these networks to get, which, I mean, last episode, we talked all about how Mitch is a master networker. Yeah. But, uh, how do we bring all these parties together so everybody can respond? I agree. Cause it takes a, t- it takes a team. It can't, mm-hmm. law enforcement is going to do what they have to do. Like you said, we're legal things we have to do, right? If the person you know, they got to be a danger to themselves, danger to others, or gravely disabled. Those are the three criteria they have to meet for 5150. Mm-hmm. And if they meet those and I don't do what I'm responsible for and that person goes out and commits suicide or hurts somebody else, then that liability is on me. You had mm-hmm. contact with this person. You, yeah. They said these things. And everything now, law enforcement-wise, is all on body cam, so it's not like you can hide anything, right? So everything is there. It's just we would have to do it. But are they getting the help that they need by just mm-hmm. sending them to county mental health? Mm-hmm. They go through triage at county mental health. They say, no, I'm, I'm not suicidal now. I'm good to go. Guess what county mental health does? 
we don't have the bed for We're you. We're bound you by the same. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. put, they push them out and they come right back to yeah. out there. So it's that revolving door, but where does the, where can we do? Like, do we, is it a lot of it? Sadly to say, always goes back to funding. Right. And right. Yeah. So, which is sad. And it's an entire culture shift. And I'm, I'm thinking about the culture shift because if you haven't listened yet, go back and listen to our first episode with Officer Mitch when we're talking about school resource officers and the value that may or may not be placed on school resource officers and the potential there lies in that position. Mm -hmm. And Officer Mitch spent six years shifting culture and creating this beautiful culture within the school where the school resource officer is valued, is preventative, is creating relationships and fostering community relationships. And that takes six years. So when we talk about law enforcement and mental health as we move forward, that is also a culture shift that's not going to happen overnight. So this wish list is cool because it may not happen immediately. But if you're listening and you've got things going through your head of like, well, what if we do this? And what if we try this? Like, let's do it. Let's shift. This is not my cup of tea because I am not in crisis work. But I know Nick's got lots of ideas of how we can shift the culture. Let's, let's talk. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let this episode inspire you. It's that utopia of, of what you want, right, for for that. So if we had the perfect world to make it, what would that look like? And like I said, you go back to the school resource thing. That was a team effort, right? You know, it was a team that can help provide a little bit with some of those students that I dealt with on a daily I love your example of, yeah, three o'clock in the morning, you get that person in crisis. What kind of help do we have? So, mm-hmm. you know, the county I work in right now, we have a mobile crisis team. Awesome. They come out throughout the day. What yeah. happens at night? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's a true statement that you have. The resources are less, you know, maybe the call volume is less, too. Mm-hmm. However, it's just one person that we end up having to deal with that. Mm-hmm. If that crisis team was available, you know, what could it offer? And I think I mean, thinking about your role on the school campus, right, and how many people that you just had those personal relationships with that responded probably more positively to you than the school therapist, right? There's going to be calls. If you have that co-response team, you've got options, Mm -hmm. right? So some people would respond more positively to an officer than they would. Maybe they have bad experience with the mental health system, right? And they don't want to talk to that therapist, but I'm willing to talk with you um, and just the team aspect of it and being able to pivot and... But if you don't have that, if I don't have that relationship with you as a therapist on campus, you know what yeah. I mean? If you and I have a good relationship working together exactly. and understanding of mm-hmm. what you can do, other. right? What exactly. you can do and what I can do. Yep. I mean, it, it, that's where I think you kind of start succeeding. We, I, The school I did work at, we had one where a student, big kid, big, strong kid, super angry, super, super angry. Counselor calls me and even me, I'm like, okay, man, he's in a bad mood. He's really upset. It's a big boy, right? Um, so I go in there, I'm like, what am I going to do? And I go, hey, you like to work out? And it was one little thing that, but I, but the, I could see the counselor, you know, she worked with them, got to a certain point, And then basically it was like, okay, I need some help with this one. And then I worked with them. So it was like having that working relationship. But to me, mm-hmm. that's where that's a team. You can't do this. It's too big yeah. on such a high level that you can't do it on your own. Absolutely. Yep. And you have to be able to recognize each individual's part in it. Absolutely. And that team is not only beneficial for the people on the receiving end, but mm-hmm. we talk about, we spend a lot of time on this podcast also talking about the mental health of professionals mm-hmm. and really giving professionals permission to prioritize their mental health because some of these jobs are intense and you're earlier, actually, I don't know if it was earlier, if it was the previous episode, but officer Mitch mentioned uh, how normal it was and he said maybe normal is not the right word or maybe it is because it does become normal for our Mm -hmm. work life because that's what we're used to seeing is trauma and crisis and all of these things and so when I hear about the team I'm like oh y'all could also be there for each other because you guys are going to encounter these situations that are going to be traumatic at some point and you also have each other to help work through it and support each other in that capacity as well so that's what I see as the benefit Okay, so that's a good segue because over the 20 years you've been in law enforcement, um, I'm going to, like, stereotypically mental health wasn't a thing, right? Didn't exist. Or if it did, we weren't allowed to acknowledge it. You know, this um, stereotype or this judgment that I can't go see the department psychologist because they're actually there to look out for the department and not me. And I'm going to put on administrative leave and all that. Have you noticed a shift in how the field itself views officer or de- deputy health? Absolutely. There's okay. been a huge, a huge shift. Um, I'll give you one quick example of a call that I was on early in my career. And uh, 
still to this day, I just, I actually just went to this critical incident stress management course, this four hour course. And we had to, uh, we provided peer support for the other people in, in your group, right? We would hear stories that they told. And I, I actually shared this story because this is, I don't know, probably 17 years ago and it still resonates with me. And it's not the actual incident itself. It's what the lack of things that happened afterwards. And so I had a call of, uh, um, oh, the elderly gentleman calls, calls dispatch, says, hey, I'm in my back bedroom. My wife just went to the to the grocery store, I'm terminally ill. I'm tired of feeling the pain. I'm going to kill myself. Here's where I'm going to be. And it would have been like the call coming out and I was literally a block away. So he even says today, he's got it down to the point where he says it's a mobile home. I left the back door unlocked. So I pull up to this mobile home park. I'm by myself. I get out. You know, every mobile home, you don't know which side is the front door or not. Mm-hmm. So I go what I think is the the back door and it's not. So it's that one's locked. So I go back around and I feel that it's unlocked. I walk into like a mud room, like a wash, uh, mm-hmm. laundry room. And I can hear the guy on the phone. And as I get to this doorway, to the left is this hallway where all the bedrooms were. And to the right is the kitchen living room. So as I look to the left, I can see him. He's sitting into the first bedroom on the right and he's sitting got his, the phone in his left hand and he's got a revolver in his right hand. And the revolver's kind of like pointed right at my direction. And I get on the radio real quick. I said, hey, send me a unit. And I tell dispatch, keep talking. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Like, how can I, how can I stop this man from doing it? Mm-hmm. And they send a second deputy there. He has to be younger than I am. So now I'm the, the senior guy and I still have to be the one to make the decision. So the only concept that could come out with stopping this thing is maybe I have a chance if I am able to tase this guy, he'll drop the gun and then maybe that's it. So I end up taking off my duty belt, grab my taser out. The guy who's with me has got to provide lethal coverage for me. As I go to start crawling up, he looks over, sees us and he pulls the trigger and he kills himself in this room. And I remember sitting there, you could smell the gunpowder, you could feel it, all this kind of stuff. Right. And as we, then an investigation comes, everyone comes, we talk to her family, all, talk to the wife, all this kind of stuff. And I remember literally it's an hour and a half, two hours I'm on this call. And the next thing they say is, hey, you got a, another call on your beat. And it was a child custody call. <laughs> and it was like, here you go from this traumatic, this huge thing that you just saw and witnessed it. You feel it, you smell it, all these things. Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, go to the other call. Mm-hmm. And it's not the call itself that gets me. It's just the fact that there was no, there was nothing done to follow up afterwards. It was just like, hey, you saw something bad, put it in your backpack and continue to move on. So, yeah. um, to a child custody case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just a so, late one for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So law enforcement has completely changed. There's the, the focus on mental health when it comes to law enforcement is, is, is it went from zero to a hundred and, it, and it's taken some time. But for instance, we like for our agency, we have an app that's a, an app that we have the ability to, there's kind of all kinds of coping mechanisms, but it has our EAP program in it. It has um, people you can reach out to. We are big, including not only just the law enforcement, the cops on the street, but a lot of these things you got to include our dispatchers too, mm-hmm. who are inside yeah. the dispatch center yeah. and they're hearing the call. They're dealing with this and they're painting a picture of it in their own mind. So they're Absolutely. going through it too. Yeah. So the idea is if you have some sort of critical incident or something that's pretty intense, a baby death, something to that extent is immediately, if not by the end of that shift, at least in the next day, you know, to have some sort of diffusing debriefing sit down, um, you know, there's a, uh, like for our agencies, we offer EMDR, which is the high, <gasps> high movement. Yeah. Okay. I am so excited. Yeah. And now you can have your so, nerdy no. Oh my goodness. So yes. we, we have, a, yes. we have a, a, a person, a talent therapist in town that works EMDR. We have her on, uh, on the call basically. Beautiful. Um, has to be a culture change for this to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you're starting to see that switch, right? Mm-hmm. There's some people out there still, they're going to be like, Hey, look, I'm cool. Yeah, maybe you say you're cool, but are you really cool? For sure. um, mm-hmm. So, or I'm fine. I'm fine. Exactly. Everything yeah. is I'm fine. Yeah. And even and it could be as simple as this. Like, let's say you know you go through some sort of critical incident. Maybe you don't have a, a defusing or a debriefing immediately, but maybe I just triage the those officers that were on scene before they go home, and it's having the knowledge of saying, okay, hey, you just went through this critical incident. This is probably what you're going to think about and feel about over the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But I promise you within that 24 hour to 48 hour period, we'll all sit down as a group and we'll go from there. And you're starting to see it as 
being more normal. So uh, some education, and some psycho, I'm over here thinking psychoeducation, right? But of here's what to look out for yeah. so that 12 hours later when they're experiencing something, if they have no background or nothing to base it on you, you as their sergeant or whatever role you're coming from in that uh, instance has already said, hey, you might experience this, yes. this, this, or yes. this. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's like a triage. I call it a triage of, of mm-hmm. it. Um, and even like just recognizing the signs, like, mm-hmm. you know, hearing somebody joke about things or noticing like, hey, dude, mm-hmm. this person is drinking a lot more than they already had, mm-hmm. you know, like, mm-hmm. and not ignoring those signs and just saying, hey, man, you good? And it's like I said, it's becoming not so taboo. And it's like you said, you don't want you talk about, you know, the psychiatrist that's on on books for us to go talk to. Though that person's there is to help you. They're not the, they're not supporting administration. A lot of times it's all, you know, confidentiality mm-hmm. it has to right. be an, a, a huge thing. And it's just having that courage to start talking. And then Mm -hmm. just like anything, hey, man, I went through this. I went and talked. I feel a hundred times better. All right. Maybe Mm -hmm. that gives the courage for someone else to go do it. So, like I said, what you used to be like, oh, put it in that lockbox and keep it there and just deal with it. That's clear. You'd be like, no, let's let's help you unload whatever is in that box slowly. Mm -hmm. So you can like I talk about as I get closer to retirement, I want to be physically, emotionally and mentally good. Like I want to live my life. Afterwards, I don't want to be holding all these things in here. So yeah. I'm a big proponent of it. I support it. Um, and like I said, it's it's a culture change, but it's it's happening. So you're starting to see the shift even formally, right, where departments are offering or encouraging these debriefs, defusings. What about peer-to-peer? Is there mm-hmm. a shift there in 100%. terms of just talking yeah, about yeah. it? And- so right now, for instance, I'll just use my, my department as an example. As a patrol supervisor, I have five guys that work with me for a year. I know them inside and out as far as, you know, what their family life is going on. Like I know when they come to work, if they're in a, you know, how they're feeling, you can see it in their eyes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just treating that person as a number as I'm treating that person as a person. And yeah, we have to deal with all this stuff on the street, but we may have our own personal issues that we're going through exactly. and where does the merge come? But it's having the ability to, and the courage to say, Hey dude, you good. You know? Mm-hmm. And so you're seeing that, like I said, that culture has shifted and we want to make sure that everyone at least for the department that I work in, it's it's something that, you know, our chief at the time, you know, made it a very high priority. He put he awesome. invested the time, the training, the money into it, and I believe it's paying dividends. Awesome. That investment is so important because it, it ultimately falls into funding and administration and leadership to choose to invest in this. And the investment can bring so much reward if we can work on the preventative side, right, versus being on the reactive end. And so it just makes me so happy to hear uh, that there is that there's a lot of shift in the culture and that there are things to move towards being able to take care of people who are on payroll doing this job, keeping our community safe. Right. And I'm oh, still back to EMDR. <laughs> All right, Mitch. I'm gonna, back I mean, Officer about. Mitch. Tell me, I I know how I would describe EMDR. What do you, how would you define EMDR for our listeners who don't know what it is? You know, it's, it's military based, if I'm correct. It's, it's something that they were doing with vets afterwards, and it's eye movement, rapid something. I don't know what the actual acronym is for. But they sit you down, and, and the cool thing about it is it gets you to focus on one, one incident and how to start dealing with that incident. And if you're feeling certain things, you know, where to go to help cope with that, that incident. So I went through EMDR on two different things. The first one has taken four or five different sessions to work through it, but I have a silly one and, you know, I've started gaining this anxiety about driving and I'm have a fear of getting in a head on collision for mm-hmm. whatever reason. Like I don't want my life to end that way, but it was one of those ones where I'm catching myself driving in a car and like I'm feeling it in my hands, all these kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah. It sounds silly as it much, but EMDR allowed EMDR allowed me to work through that. And now I have a working coping skills is that if I start feeling that anxiety working up that I could go to this place and, and deal with it. So mm-hmm. it really and they did do on scale. So like I was at a 10. Right. And then now I'm at like a one or two when I go to driving. So mm-hmm. I was at first. You know, you do some tapping stuff. Your eyes go back and forth. You do all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, it's the strangest thing. It is. I'm like, is this, <laughs> I'm like, is this thing really working? But ultimately, as I continue to go through the sessions um, and, the, and the therapist pushed me like, you know, mm-hmm. she she did a good job of, you know, I did it two different ways. I did it in a group setting and, uh, and as by myself. So um, group setting was a, a little bit more different, but the same concept. And, and it does have power mm-hmm. coming out of it. You know, you have to go in there open minded. You mm-hmm. have to go in there thinking, OK, I'm going there to get the help. And like I said, 
one took a little bit longer than the other, but I was I was impressed. I was a and uh, just shifting yeah. our. So far, by the way, so <laughs> I know this, I knew you were going to. And we're shifting. I've been nerding out <laughs> this entire time, and then you heard EMDR. I knew that was going to get you. Um, but we just. I'm going to use the word siloed again. Apparently, that's my word of the day. Um, but we separate mental health and physical health, right? I mean, even you said, I want to retire mentally well, physically well, and emotionally well. But they're also interconnected, right? Sure. So the mind-body connection with everything you see. I mean, you said, yeah, I have these anxiety about a head-on collisions. How many head-on collisions have you responded to in your mm-hmm. career, <laughs> right? I mean. And that's why I think it's part mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, absolutely. 100% absolutely. all the things you see. So mm-hmm. like I said, I heard one person say it best, you know, especially in law enforcement or military you brought up but you know you collect each one of these little tragic incidents you go through which is almost on a daily i don't even know what the averages are but the i know it's something like you know a civilian person will go through one critical incident or four critical incidents in their lifetime where we're going to potentially one, one a day shift. Yeah, shift. One, yeah. Yeah, one a shift and you know you're putting all these things in this backpack that you're carrying around with and you know you want to offload maybe sometimes on your family but then you don't want to bring them into it it's not the good thing either so they may do all these other things to kind of cope with it where it's like hey maybe if we address this earlier is this something that could have been like you said you know you're being proactive to it right not reactive so you're preventative it was the word you used so i agree i mean i think we make it a priority the people that are in this profession you know, have to have the courage to, it's okay to talk about it, bro. Like you're not going to be the only cool kid. You're not going to take your gun. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. those type of things. I think we have to promote it. And like I said, agencies are on a scale of zero to hundred. It used to be zero. And now it's probably up in the nineties of what they're, they're making it a focus. Well done law enforcement. Right. Well done. And I think, I think this is where I just want to touch on one thing before we wrap up. Alyssa had mentioned the investment in, mental health and training and such, but it's not just the financial investment for departments. Mm-hmm. If your department had sent you all to a training that they paid woohoo bucks for mm-hmm. and had the best of the f- best, you know, teaching you all about taking care of yourselves. Like us, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just contract kidding. to the small town counseling. Um, if leadership and the brass was not modeling this acceptance and openness, would it have caught on? No, absolutely not. That's, that, yeah, that's, that's where I think the culture comes into play because I, I can go from anything. It's like, okay, do as I say, not as I do. And yeah. um, I think that's where it starts. I mean, like I said, the chief who just retired, um, he made this a priority mm-hmm. and he not only invested in it, you know, with uh, financially, but he made it a point. I mean, he would bring it up in our staff meetings and say, hey, make sure you're checking in with your guys. You know, are we using the Cortico app? Do you know how to access Cortico? If someone says that's the app that we're using, um, but, you know, does your people know how to access that? Are they accessing it? You know, he wanted even numbers as far as, you know, are we providing enough services? Do we, we need to increase it? Like we have our EAP, mm-hmm. but it was one of our officers who believed in EMDR that brought it to the attention of the chief and then put that therapist on payroll so and i would say that just a little tidbit the average utilization rate of eap varies to like nine to twelve percent yeah it's really underutilized I, I mean so one of my very best friends is a physician and works at a county hospital uh, in the height of covid did a little study and i don't remember i'm looking off camera i don't remember the percentage of physicians that were utilizing the eap in like 2021 after that initial kind of peak and it was I'm I'm pulling this number out of thin air, but it was less than 5%. So very, very low utilization. People either don't know about them, can't access it. There's barriers to accessing it. It's hard. It's limited. And that's not a shot at EAP. It just means that there's some work to figure out how we can increase the utilization as organizations because it's a great, it's a great asset to have, but if no one's using it, then something needs to change. So, something's not working. Yeah. So I, I love that your leadership is talking about utilization and if there's barriers and do we need more? Is it enough? Like those are the kinds of conversations that we want to hear people having around yeah. having around supporting the wellness of their employees and their staff. Yeah, I think you can't overlook it. Like I mean, just the like you said, the investment that you put in for it. I mean, it could save that person's life. Like just take mm-hmm. for instance, quite literally. Let's take Uvalde. <laughs> Like the incident in Uvalde, right? Those officers that went through that, right? Now they're being crucified. And they're the ones that went through it. They went and they saw it. They did all this stuff. But now the community's crucifying. Is that going to be, some of it's going to be a career ending for them. Mm-hmm. Some of it may be life ending for them. You know what I mean? Because how are they going to deal with that? And what is that, what does that peer support look like for an agency like that? So 
I think it, it goes to culture of the, the organization that you're at. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you value it and you value your employees, then that thing is going to, it's going to take off. It's going to be there. And like I said, some agencies are better than the other, but I think we're all, the shift is going to a big way than it used to be when it comes to law enforcement. Cool. I hope you all enjoyed this episode as much as Nick and I did, because it, it was phenomenal having this conversation with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being Welcome. here. I appreciate it. Yeah. If our listeners want to contact you, where can they find you? Oh, they can hit me up. My my cell phone number is 209-505-4890. I'm serious. <laughs> hey, any, anybody wants to reach out, I'm, I'm open for conversation. Um, I just, I, this is something I'm passionate about. Like if I have a platform to say things and, and you know, to talk to people, then um, I'm good with it. That was so brave of you. Just so everybody is aware, Officer Mitch is also happily married, so please only contact him for work and consulting purposes. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> we appreciate you. Yes, Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, Thank you guys. Yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you guys for joining us. This is the Therapist Uncut Podcast. My name is Alyssa Nahara. We're here with Officer Mitch and Nick Young. And please subscribe, like, share this episode with anybody who you think could benefit from it. And for show notes, go to therapistuncut.com. Bam. Thank you for joining Therapist Uncut, a production of AMP Smart Business. To learn more about Therapist Uncut and stay up on upcoming episodes, please subscribe and follow us on social media. As a reminder, although the Therapist Uncut co-hosts are licensed therapists, they are not your therapist. This podcast is not intended to substitute professional mental health counseling. If you need professional therapy, please contact your local provider or primary care provider. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Therapist Uncut.